Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Burgess Jules. I'm an archivist at uh, University of California Riverside. I'm also one of the um, I'm also one of the um, principal investigators for this uh, project, uh, documenting the now. Am I not in the screen? Should I just sit down? I'll stand. It's fine. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm looking at that camera. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is, a, I, you know, I want to thank the Mellon Foundation for funding this work. Um, I think, you know, in the short time that uh, we've been um, doing the project, we've done a lot to really uh, diversify the conversation. We've brought in a lot, of, lot more people um, into the conversation around social media archiving, web archiving. Uh, it feels like a really inclusive space. Uh, if you just look at this room here today, um, we're really excited about the folks who decided to join us. So. Um, Really grateful to be here. Glad to share this meeting uh, with a lot more people. I know we have some watch parties going on out there, so thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, please remember to use the DocNow community hashtag um, as you're tweeting at us, and follow us on Twitter at DocumentNow. Um, so send us some tweets. We want you to be part of the conversation today. Uh, as you're listening to the panel, send questions in. We'll try to get um, as many of them as we can to be part of the conversation. Um, so our first panel today is uh, really exciting because it's a group of scholars that you know, I really look up to, and I've been um, following their work really closely as we've been doing this social media archiving work. Um, Dr. Jessica Johnson, Dr. Sarah Jackson, and Dr. Mark Anthony Neal. Um, and we're really excited to have them here because What's happening now is we have this sort of, sort of explosion of information really um, happening uh, on social media. We see it a lot, obviously, um, as we've been following the activism over the last couple of years around police killings of African Americans. And you know, we really wanted an opportunity for scholars to talk to us and, and to engage with, with us librarians and archivists and other folks in the room about what this sort of new information means uh, for their scholarly um, work, right? How has it changed? How are they looking at um, content differently as they do their work? Um, and so we really are interested to just hear more from you about how social media, web archives, has influenced your work uh, in the last few years as, as this has become more popular. Um, and tell us a little bit more about your projects uh, and you know, how we could sort of, really we just want to know what you do. So we're excited to have you here, and I'll pass it uh, over to our panelists who will do some self-introductions, and we'll get right into the conversation. Mark, do you want to go first? Of course I don't. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> do you want to go first, Jessica? Mark. It's all, it's all, it's all you, Jen. OK. I <laughs> Uh, to be put on the spot. Um, uh, so, uh, Jessica Marie Johnson. So, I, um, hello everyone, good morning. This is um, really exciting to be here. It's really great to have everyone here. Um, it was an honor to be asked to, to speak about anything because this is a fantastic project and a really important project. Um, so, to have any kind of role and participation in, in this meeting is just really, really, really wonderful. Um, I, um, I am currently. Um, uh, assistant Professor of History and Africana Studies at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Um, and the work I do is very directly related to what I research. So I'm very interested and invested in um, histories of slavery and histories of diaspora. Um, I'm interested in the ways that um, enslaved women in particular are navigating um, systems of bondage and navigating systems of manumission um, and freedom. Um, I'm also interested in the way that um, enslaved uh, people of color are traveling, are circulating the Atlantic world, are communicating, and in that sense are, are building um, networks of, of resistance um, uh, in that sense. Um, do you want to all do intros or should I? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm Sarah Jackson. I'm a professor of communication studies at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. And my research area is generally, I'm a social movement scholar. I study activism, particularly racial justice activism and feminist activism. Um, I try generally to not say those things as one and then the other because I try to study intersectional activism in particular. Um, so a lot of my work is on um, black feminist activism, um, queer black activism, et cetera. 
um, and particularly the communication strategies that um, activists use um, contemporarily and sort of how those communication strategies are different or similar from historical social movements. Um, and so one of the reasons I'm excited to be here is that um, I'm going to share with you after we do introductions um, some of the ways that I'm thinking about um, social media and social media activism through the lens of um, social movement scholarship and through communication scholarship and sort of the opportunities that are opened up um, through um, having digital tools that allow us to sort of c collect and examine um, the voices of, of activists online. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. Um, I've been writing and thinking about black popular culture for about 20 years um, and have been thinking about black popular culture itself as a form of public scholarship. Um, so obviously I've been interested in, in how we as scholars have continuously built platforms, um, social platforms to be able to talk to each other and also to reach wider audiences to do a kind of interventionist model, if you will, in our scholarship um, where folks are consuming black popular culture, particularly around questions of gender and sexuality, um, race obviously, class and, and other, social, other social and political dynamics within that. Um, so, uh, so to expand a little bit on the, I guess, the digital thing and the, the reason, some of the things I want to talk about today, um, in 2008, I founded the blog African Diaspora PhD. Um, so African Diaspora PhD was a blog that came out of work I was doing um, and the communities I was operating in online, which were around radical and social media. Um, radical media first, and then social media got created, and so then it was social media. Um, and it's a blog that highlights scholarship and, and scholars who are doing publishing um, and doing research around the topics of slavery and diaspora. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, that was interesting in sort of creating that were the ways that it opened up space for new kinds of information to get created and to be disseminated. So it was, and it seems so, um, <laughs> So out of date in some ways now, where so much information is public. Um, one of the um, spaces where I blog now is the African American Intellectual History Society. Um, and that is like literally connecting folks who are doing scholarship and doing research around African American intellectual thought across time and place to the public. Like anybody can access it. It has an ethos of public access um, and a commitment to, um, to justice. Uh, so, so it seems like a, a sort of afterthought um, when I think back on it. But at the time, there were even more than now, like there was a very strong sort of division between work that was getting created, research that was happening, uh, particularly around slavery um, in the academy and things that were being discussed um, on the ground. So a more clear example that is even more related to this um, and is one of, is part of a, a larger project I'm interested in around slavery and digital humanities um, is a project called the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. Um, and that project is based right now, if I'm not mistaken, at Emory, um, but it had its first sort of grand opening out of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at Harvard. Um, and, it, and when it, opened. Um, it had been the project of research done by, you know, scholars, um, you know, mainly in the U.S., um, a few scholars in Brazil, um, scholars who were, uh, who were in the academy who were working, in, and it wasn't a surprise when it opened. Um, it w was cataloging um, it, those who were enslaved, individuals enslaved, and who were brought across the Atlantic on slave ships. So they went through slave registers in across several countries and compiled them into this ma massive, massive database. Um, it's huge, it's quantified, you can search by ship, you can search by um, location, um, it's slavewages.org if anybody wants to look it up and play with it now. Um, and it has a ton of information that for a while people just kind of had to assume that they knew the numbers um, or the um, origins or the um, regions that people were going from and to and what the, how many ships came, et cetera, et cetera. So it's this fantastic, amazing project. When it opened, when it has its debut, if I'm not mistaken, at William & Mary, uh, 95, 98, um, what scholars came to come and hear about the numbers and the data and you know what are the new patterns and the trends and the percentages and everything. But what you also so what also happened is that you had um, churches who brought um, people, um, their parishioners. You had um, local groups. You had local historians. You had community groups. Most of these were African American or people of African descent, and most of those were people who claimed some descent, um, some slaveholding descent here in the United States. And so they came also to this event, and this was an unexpected thing. 
Um, uh, Ira Berlin writes about this in an article about slavery and, and memory and history. Um, it was an unexpected thing, um, both the numbers of those who came, but the imperative that was behind it. And their imperative was also about you know, who came, when, where, what are the rates, what are the percentages, what are the numbers, how do we crunch the data, how do we quantify it? But they also wanted to know who people were. Um, what did it mean that they came at a certain time? What were they thinking? What were they feeling? And it became a kind of, um, it, it sort of illustrates the tension that happens when we're thinking about the ways that we um, bring data, like bring people into data, um, the way that we quantify people's experiences um, and the actual imperatives and the demands that people in those communities now in the present day want to make on that same information. Um, another person who's doing amazing, who has done amazing work on this, um, Alondra Nelson's um, Social Life with DNA talks about this a lot, the way that DNA is mobilized in one sense as a kind of science and objective data, and on the other sense is also mobilized by communities. Um, in the US, at least, of those who are descended from slaves and slave owners, um, to understand more about the history that they are part of and the family connections that they are trying to understand and as a justice imperative. What does it mean that somebody is um, Congolese? What does it mean that some, as far as DNA or as far as the slave trade database? So, and how can that be used to enact the kind of um, rebalancing of an injustice that happened at a particular moment, right? Um, the question is, is, and I think in some ways, one of the interesting things even there, in either the slave trade database instance or in DNA or, or even in this project, um, not so much um, can a justice be redressed, but the act and the, the power and the, the, the uh, not the impulse, but um, the need to find some kind of redress. Like that is a thing that has to be um, both respected and appreciated, and if possible, in the most sort of social justice oriented projects, is really pushed push to the center. Like what are the ways that the communities themselves are accountable, are in, the, in a project, are, are understood to be part of the data, the making of the data, um, to be able to use it and to access it in a way that is, is organic to them. Um, so, uh, so the things that I'm thinking about when we're talking about social media in particular um, end up being really similar. So if we think of the ways that, um, that people, <laughs> black Twitter for instance, is getting crunched into nodes of data. So a tweet, 140 characters, we can archive it, we can grab it, we can, um, we can find patterns in it. You know, in a lot of ways this is what um, a tool like this can do. Um, and it's what media does. It's what um, the corporate interests do. Tumblr got purchased by Yahoo, not because you know everybody's on Tumblr and they're talking about interesting things. It's because Yahoo f believe that there's a way that you can make some kind of money out of it. Facebook is always buying something. I think Instagram was the latest thing. Now they want to be like Snapchat. Um, Twitter uh, has started adding ads. Um, started adding ads, I think, a couple of years ago, and is also trying to you know balance you know how is it seen on um, as a corporate venture versus um, the ways that people actually use it. So there's that tension. Um, so people are already being seen as nodes of data in 140 characters. In this instance, we have this really interesting opportunity, and I'm looking at it as a historian at least, to think about how nodes of data are actually speaking back. So, no, so, so how are people, how are tweets themselves sort of um, also having conversations with each other? How are people <laughs> behind the tweets having conversations both on Twitter and off? Um, how are they speaking to the idea of being data? I mean, this is an interesting moment in which people who are writers, who are media makers, people in this room are actually talking about what does it mean that our words, our conversations, and our ideas are now sources and, and how, do we, how do we, what do we want to do with that? you know, whatever that may mean. So we're also speaking back to the idea of being data um, in interesting ways that, um, that can be captured. Um, and we're also being spoken to. So it's not as though, let's say we wanted to ignore that, oh, you know, we're being crunched to 140 characters, that's a justice thing, that's a commodification thing, whatever, you know, and all the whole spectrum between we're being assimilated and we're, we're resisting. Um, whatever way we want to think about it, other people are already thinking about it. So people are already trying to think about ways that, you know, um, Gabby Douglas's hair can be clickbait, you know? So there's a point, there's a part where we're having conversation about the Olympics and there's a part where certain headlines are being thrown up in order to get people to click. Um, there's a whole conversation right now about harm online and about the ways that th those instances are also actions that do harm, for instance, um, to Gabby Douglas, <laughs> this is another example. Um, so this is also just a moment where whether or not, whether or not we want to have a conversation about the kind of 
justice or imperative behind thinking about of ourselves um, and this work as data, um, other people are. And so it's really important, in my opinion, and we can talk about this, that we get ahead of this um, or, or get into the, the kind of battle that's already happening um, and really start to, to mix it up and try and do what we can, particularly in this, again, this project is, is such a great example, um, to recenter the debate, think about redress, think about um, justice and balance, um, and add some of the humanity back into the digital part of, of what it is that we're doing. So. Um, thanks. Yeah, this is great. I love that we have a historian, a communication and social movements person, and a pop culture person, because we don't often across our fields in academia get to hear how other people are thinking about these spaces and this data, so it's actually really fun to hear that. Um, so I'm just going to sort of start off and then backtrack here. I'm in the midst of writing a book with two of my awesome colleagues, Moya Bailey and Brooke Hucco Wells, who is here, um, about hashtag activism. And the story of how I got to the point of writing a book about hashtag activism, I think, speaks a lot to some of the questions that we're going to be here talking about today. Um, I was originally trained as a journalist, thought I was going to go into journalism, and then realized that journalism does a really bad job covering the political issues that I cared about, particularly activism, particularly social movements, particularly things having to do with racial justice, particularly ha things having to do with gender and sex justice. Um, and so I decided to become an academic, which, you know, that's like what you do when you have a problem with something, then you just study it and write about how it's a problem for the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> And um, I ended up writing a dissertation about the black press. And I specifically chose um, to study the black press in graduate school um, because of this uh, theory in my field in communication studies um, called counter public sphere theory. And, and so that's kind of heady. But the idea of counter publics is that you know, there's sort of this big idea in politics and political communication that we all exist in a public sphere. And um, sort of Habermas is the famous scholar who, who coined the idea of the public sphere. And, and the idealized idea of the public sphere is that people come together in a democracy and they, they debate and think and talk about the things that matter to the citizens in the democracy. And that at some point, even if there's disagreement, people come to, you know, some kind of agreements, compromises, and make the decisions that are best for democratic society. Societies. And that's lovely and great, um, except that uh, feminist scholars in particular, feminist scholars and black scholars came along and said, hey, like that idea of the public sphere is nice, and it's nice that Habermas is saying in our contemporary society that media play this role in helping to nourish the public sphere, except for the fact that, you know, there's been all these people that were never considered citizens that were never included or part of the conversations, the democratic conversations that were happening in the public sphere. And so when we talk about some of the most sort of historically celebrated examples of the public sphere, whether we're talking about sort of like the uh, Enlightenment era French salons, or we're talking about the Lincoln-Douglas debates, or we're talking about the Continental Congress, who are the people who are actually having those democratic debates and making the decisions for the society? Well, they're an extremely tiny, tiny group of you know, able-bodied, cisgendered, heterosexual, white, property-owning, wealthy men with titles, basically, right? That's a really small proportion of the population who actually have been making up the public sphere for the majority of history, right? Um, and so counter-public sphere theorists came along and said, hey, let's acknowledge the fact that there have been these exclusions from the public sphere when we're talking about how democracy is formed. But let's also acknowledge that despite these exclusions, all these excluded groups have had a very lively um, set of democratic debates on their own, right? And so what counterpublics do is, and in, anyone who's familiar with the black press is, a, is an example that's often used, but also um, um, feminist um, publications, um, also um, queer and um, LGBTQ publications, know that counterpublics not only create, have their own debates, right, um, their own debates about what democracy should look like, who should be included, um, what types of social change need to happen or not happen, but they also very actively try to intervene in that mainstream public sphere and have their voices heard. Um, and so I sort of came out of thinking about all this stuff into, you know, the 21st century, which is this moment of um, huge technological innovation and change. And so as somebody who had been studying media and journalism and thinking about the different ways that different voices were or weren't included in the public sphere that journalism allowed, 
I sort of had to also start thinking about digital technology. I had to start thinking about um, online media because um, one of the amazing things that I think we've all been lucky enough to witness is that there's these new spaces where counter publics are able to grow and spread messages um, online and actually hear their voices heard more quickly um, and with less moderation um, from sort of mainstream narratives than ever before. Um, and so that's how I got to this place where I started studying hashtag, act hashtag activism. And it's interesting because it was actually prior to Ferguson, um, my colleague Brooke and I witnessed, I don't know if you all remember, it was early 2014, the New York City Police Department attempted this PR campaign. They said, hey, tweet us with photos of you and the New York City Police with hashtag MyNYPD. And you know, if you're lucky enough, we'll like feature you on our Facebook page, right? And what happened was that, of course, citizens, mostly young people, um, mainly people of color, started tweeting photos of police brutality. So they said, sure, I have photos with the New York City Police Department. You know, here's this person in a headlock. Here's, you know, et cetera. Um, Occupy Wall Street was really active um, still at that time, and they were tweeting photos of sort of police crackdowns of protesters. And then people started tweeting about historical cases. So they started tweeting pictures of Amadou Diallo. They started tweeting pictures of sort of other sort of famous cases in which um, the NYPD had, had abused citizens. And essentially what happened on Twitter was completely out of the control of the mainstream. And so this was a moment where I went, aha. So what we see is that the mainstream public sphere, the, the elites, the people who have always had power to write the narrative, right, tried to use this new technology to continue their narrative. And regular people, right, some people were activists, some people were members of activist organizations, but a lot of the people that we found in our study were just everyday regular people. You wouldn't know them from Adam. They only had, you know, a couple dozen followers on Twitter, started tweeting these images, right, and they blew up, right? It went viral. And soon enough, the story in the news media even became, oh, you know, people hijacked the hashtag MyNYPD on Twitter. Now, of course, you can't control what the news media says. So the news media covered it as a, you know, PR campaign fail. They said, oh, you know, um, everyone has been trolled on Twitter. This happens to everyone. And, and we all went, no, this doesn't happen to everyone. It happens to the NYPD when they try to get you to, to, to post warm and fuzzy photos. But so that's how this all started, right? And then, you know, within four or five months, boom, right? We have this moment here um, where uh, people on the ground in Michael Brown's community um, start tweeting about witnessing something that by all, you know, for all intents and purposes has become the, was the spark for a new civil rights movement, right? Um, we had Trayvon before that, right? We had Oscar Grant before that. But this moment um, of particularly the images of Michael Brown laying on the ground for four and a half hours that his neighbors took photos of and, and tweeted, although they were asked later to take those photos down by his family and did so, um, really caused this spark. And so um, we studied that. And what we found was that in the first days, um, um, within 20 minutes of Michael Brown being shot, the first people who were tweeting about um, what was happening in Ferguson, they weren't elites, they weren't activists, they weren't celebrities, um, they weren't journalists, they were members of Michael Brown's community, right? Um, and one of the most influential tweets we found was just from a woman who was a neighbor of Michael Brown, um, and her narrative about what happened that day, um, you know, she said 17-year-old kid was walking home from the store, you know, um, and it really became a frame that shaped the rest of the narrative and how we told the story of what happened to Michael Brown. And this was really powerful when we, when we found this because what we found was that the more elite folks, the folks with more activist training or um, the folks um, who were local journalists, when they came to the story later, they started in many ways repeating the initial narrative that these sort of everyday members of the communities told, right? And of course, that wasn't always the case. Some news outlets didn't do that. Um, but one of the things that the counter public did in this case was very actively interrogate the mainstream narrative about what was happening. So the St. Louis Post-Dispatch would post a tweet that says, you know, community, uh, rioting in Ferguson after da-da-da, right? And a member of the community would modify the tweet and say, 
you know, how, wh how, why is angry people wanting answers for a boy being killed rioting, right? And then that would be the tweet that went viral, not the, not the original St. Louis uh, post dispatch tweet. So all that to say, um, I think there's a lot of really awesome opportunities here. And, and now that we're sort of in the, the dregs and when we're really studying a lot of different hashtag activism here, um, we're looking at the activism um, that comes out of um, trans communities online. We're looking at activism that comes out of um, black feminist communities online. And we're seeing over and over again these really amazing opportunities where these conversations that used to be invisible, um, conversations about the type of street harassment that particularly young girls of color experience, right? The type of um, violence that particularly trans women of color experience. These used to be conversations that just weren't accessible in the mainstream public sphere that in many ways um, have become accessible if you know where to look, if you know what hashtags to follow, and in some ways have really um, shifted our national conversations about these topics. So um, that's kind of why I'm here and what I'm interested in thinking more about. And I think I talked too long, so I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Thanks. So Black Studies is, is, is at a moment now where it might be more visible. And I'm getting crazy feedback. So I'm hearing my voice because someone can help me with that. OK. So black studies is at a moment where it's incredibly visible at this point in time. Um, in some ways, I think it's unprecedented, right? But black studies has always been committed to public scholarship. It's always helpful to remember that you know the boys is so the black folks were serialized in the Atlantic Monthly, you know, in the late 1890s. So black scholars have always had a kind of commitment to that. I came into the academy just at the time when folks like my fair Dyson, Cornell West, Bell Hooks. Um, Patricia Williams, um, all these folks are becoming really famous. And so we all, at least in my cohort of graduate students, all came into the academy thinking that we were going to be like television stars, that we were going to be on Charlie Rose and, and all, we we're going to be on NPR all the time and what have you. The person that, that's significant to me from that particular moment is someone like Manning Marable, because Manning Marable clearly saw himself as a public scholar as he's doing this very traditional stuff, but his model was very different. His model was to write a 500, 600 word column on a weekly basis that he offered up for free to the black press. And I think that was important because he wasn't trying to be famous in the way, and not to say that Dyson and West and all these folks were just simply trying to be famous, but he was also trying to speak it and make it plain to everyday folks. And he knew he had to do that in places like the City Sun and the Amsterdam News, um, the Chicago Defender, and, and again, he offered up his writing for free to these spaces so that he could better connect with folks. Um, you know, we're at the moment memorializing a figure like George Curry, who passed away yesterday, um, legendary black journalist. Um, but of course, one of his biggest marks was this magazine called Emerge Magazine, which was initially founded in 1988, ran until 2000. Curry himself ran it from 1992 to 2000. And it still remains one of the most unique spaces in which you had black scholars and journalists, policymakers, making it plain and writing to a very uh, specific black general audience. Um, I came into the internet space you know, 20 years ago because of the work of folks like Abdullah Kalimat and, and the great uh, listserv that he had put together, the work of Art McGee, who really is a critical figure in thinking about the development of a black digital presence going back 25 years, you know, as he's overseeing the Afro AM site, and you have folks like Dr. Geisler in that space. And of course, all of this is occurring at the same time that you have scholars like Marlon, like Manny Marable and Barbara Ransby coming together around the Black Radical Congress, right? And the Black Radical Congress saw itself as something that would be embedded in this new digital moment, even as they didn't quite know what exactly this digital moment was. You go forward to 20 years to where we are now, and what we're seeing now is not just the visible presence of black studies, but what I would think, what I like to describe is the aggregation of black studies. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that we're all writing work and trying to make it available and accessible in these spaces, but there's also a commitment to what you know someone like Henry Jenkins would call spreadability, right? And, and, and Jenkins is always clear about the distinction between sharing stuff and spreadable, right? When, he talks about that when you talk about sharing, you think about viruses, right? But when you think about spreadability, think about it in the context of peanut butter, right? Something that's solid and stable and it has some sort of substance to it. But when you think about the folks who are committed to 
aggregating black studies in this moment. So it's not just about what we're writing, but an active engagement of what's also being produced elsewhere and making sure that folks have access to that kind of visibility. So in the context of my own work, you know, I started New Black Man, which is now New Black Man in Exile, now 11 years ago. And the whole purpose of it, obviously, was to promote my book, New Black Man, when it came out <laughs> in 2005. You know, what it has become now is, besides being my digital home, it is a resource for folks who have interest, obviously, in black studies, but, you know, whatever is in my own intellectual purview. 90% of the content on New Black Man is not my original content. Um, it's either uh, a, a way for younger junior scholars to be able to do an interventionist model of scholarship immediately, you know, in the context of whether or not it's book reviews and movie reviews and what have you. It's also a space where we're able to embed critical information coming from other sources and other sources of content. And again, this is important because someone has to do the work of knowing where the good content is and creating a space and a hub for folks to be able to realize where that content is. When we think about the syllabus movement that has occurred over the last two or three years, whether we're talking about the Ferguson syllabus or the Charleston syllabus, the great work that the folks at AAIHS have been doing over the last two years to make sure that there is, a, again, this kind of model for the aggregation of black studies. When you think back to the work for the last five or six years that the Crumb Feminist Collective has done in terms of, again, doing that kind of work of aggregating black studies, in this case around ideas of a radical black feminism, if we think about the work that the Feminist Wire has been doing again along the same three or four years to do that kind of work, um, this has been important. Again, for my own work, part of that has been something like Left to Black, which we founded with the John Hope Franklin Center at Duke back in 2010. And you know, I grew up at a time where, you know, for me, in terms of media presence, there was no one more significant, at least for my young self, than someone like Gil Noble. Gil Noble hosted a television show in New York City you know, for about 30 years called Like It Is. Um, the first video that I ever saw of Malcolm X was on Like It Is. The first time I saw folks like Manny Merville on television, it was Like It Is. Um, you know, this was the great work that Gil Noble was doing. It was a public affairs program that attempted to have serious black discussions and again, make it available to everyday black folks, like my parents, for instance. And then we wanted to do that with Left to Black. Knowing that, you know, while some of our folks will end up on NPR and some of our folks will end up on PBS, the majority of the great work that's being produced in our field, you know, first of all, these outlets not only don't have an interest in it, but if they do have an interest with it, they don't treat it with the kind of care and sensitivity and love, you know, that it deserves to be cared for. And so we have produced now over 200 episodes of Left to Black, many of scholars and activists writing about work that's important to us and, and making sure, you know, we, we've gone from it being something that was an hour long, that was perhaps too long to think about, something that's more 12 or 15 minutes so that we can keep people's attention spans. And that work has been critically important to thinking about how we take the work of black studies and making it much more available. Um, I end with this by telling this, you know, this very quick story because, you know, I often wonder, we often wonder beyond the clicks what the impact of a show like Left the Black has been over the last six years. And, you know, I always tell the story of, of going to KFC one day, and let me just be honest, I don't fuck with KFC too much anymore. <laughs> but I, going to KFC one day, uh, right. on online, and, and dude is looking at me, and he's like, I've seen you before. And then he goes on to talk about how he watched the video that I did with, with Cornell West at some church in Raleigh, you know, a year and a half earlier. The fact that I was reaching this cat in KFC was critically important to me because that means that we're actually reaching the kind of audience that, that we're looking to, to reach. And so I think it's a critical moment now for us to really do the work of not only producing great scholarship, but someone has to do the work of making sure that all of this work reaches the widest audience possible. And we also need to talk about that in and of itself, being a part of the labor of being a black scholar um, at this moment in the 21st century. Is this good? Yeah. yeah. So now I can't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> We're here. All right, great. So now we have uh, about 20 minutes for questions, discussion, comments.
can we jump in? Can we have yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah. Because I, well, yeah. I guess, I'm not sure Mark can hear, but I, one of the things that you know, I hear interesting in between all the ways that we talk about our work and the ways that you know we're thinking about the work that's happening in this room um, are the, are, is a kind of conversation about who are editors. So when Mark was talking about um, uh, HNET and HFRM and aggregation, you know, it makes me think of the ways that HNET, uh, I think it's uh, Peter Knupfer who, who helped kind of make that an institution. Um, the major linchpin of HNET is the editors, the idea that there are need to be people who help to kind of manage and, you know, shift the information streams in different directions that can curate. Um, and then on the other side of that, you have folks, you know, like um, like was talking about, uh, who are creators, who are actually creating the tweets, and they're not necessarily the people who you would imagine are going to be, you know, the editors, but they are people who are really, really important. And so, what are the, you know, how do we talk about this? Is there a tension there? Is there like, you know, um, a, a great relationship there? Like, what are the ways that like editors and creators yeah. um, are working together or can be working together to create something that is. I'm actually yeah, really glad. Space. I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think you know we have to be really careful. All of us are on the on the panel are, are academics, and I think we also probably consider ourselves activists. Um, but as academics, we're in fairly privileged positions, and we're we are using data and, and, and the cultural production of people sometimes online who don't have the same time types of, of, of privilege and access that we have. So for example, I just tweeted out links to the two articles that I talked about when I was speaking, and now I'm having to tweet, hey, if you don't have access to these academic journal articles, like please email me and I'll send you a free copy, right? Because there's a paywall for, for academic journals, right? And so not everyone has access to the information. But not only that, when we use and study people's tweets or how, uh, how they're using data, this is something that we ran into in our studies, we really had to think about the fact that there are people who are extremely vulnerable, right? Um, members of Mike Brown's community who are fearful of police retribution are vulnerable if we put out their Twitter handles and their names as people who are tweeting this or that, right? Um, people who already experience violence because of their intersectional identities, like trans women of color, are very vulnerable, right? If we sort of broadcast more um, where and how to find them, right? Um, and I'm, I don't just mean vulnerable online, I mean real world really vulnerable, right? Um, and so that is something that I think we have to be really careful about, um, I, I mean, it's something I personally think about a lot as an academic, but also as a black woman, also as somebody who considers myself an activist, but has so much more um, access to spaces than, than many other people, is how do I respect the cultural production of these folks? One, not put them at risk, but also two, not um, fall into the condescending thing that, of course, I have also experienced at times in my life where I think I'm speaking for them instead of letting them speak for themselves, right? And like one of the things that the data can do is allow um, people to speak for themselves, right? Like we can try to bring it together, we can try to tell a story about it, but at the end of the day, like that wasn't our cultural production in, in the case of the things I'm studying. And so that is, those are some of the kind of the ethical things that come up. And I know there's a couple panels later today about like the ethics of using social media data. But one of the ways that we've addressed this in the, in the hashtag, hashtag activism book that we're working on is that we've actually asked the cultural producers to offer blurbs for each of our chapters. So for example, we have a chapter about the hashtag girls like us that Janet Mock started and Janet Mock awesomely agreed to give us a little blurb for the chapter about like, how, how, why she started Girls Like Us and what, where she thinks it's gone, et cetera. Um, and so we've asked, um, and she's kind of maybe more one, one of the more high profile people, but we've asked people from sort of all walks of life who we include in the study to speak back to our research in an effort to make sure that we're not simply speaking for or about, but that we're also including them in the conversation. So I think that self-reflexivity is also really important, not only for activists, but also for archivists and other people who are using this data to think about the risks that people incur by being visible online or being made more vis visible online, and also trying to lift up voices as opposed to speak over voices.
I mean, that image is never going to be deleted from the record because the image was the the image got picked up by media. I mean, it's now like you can Google it, and the image is all over Google Images. Um, so I don't think it impacts the record of the day, but I do think that when his family asked that people, I mean, that was you know the specific photo people that his family said, please stop tweeting this photo. Here's a photo of Michael in his cap and gown. Please tweet this photo instead. Most members of the counterpublic community that we studied were very receptive to that and immediately said, like, okay, we'll tweet this other photo. Now, of course, not everyone was as sensitive to that, and some people kept tweeting the other photo, you know. Um, particularly people with less connections to the community kept tweeting other photos, so it's in the record. Um, we did have a couple people in our study who deleted their tweets, so the way that we collect data, we still had a record of their tweets, but when we went back to look at the tweets, they had deleted the tweets, and we did make the decision not to include those tweets, um, because we made the decision that if somebody felt that they had to delete a tweet, or there was a case where an account had was public then, but had since been put on private, and so we didn't, you know, we didn't want, what we see is a sign from that person that they don't want the attention. There's some reason that they don't want to be pulled in or that they feel like something they put out was risky. Like, I think it's our job to try to respect that. Um, you know, the archive isn't more important than human people's lives, you know, so. Yeah. So I, I think this is a, a really important question. Um, and, you know, I think there's a, from what I've seen, there's sort of a higher level of care in the in the research community um, to sort of respect uh, requests like this, right? Like from the family saying, you know, we don't want this to be the image that people remember. Um, I see the opposite in, in the archives community, frankly, because we have this sort of uh, uh, this sort of myth of neutrality that we go by, right? Um, well, not me, but a lot of a lot of people go by, where it's like we have to get everything because this is the sort of real record. Um, and it's just, it's just not true, you know. Um, we're, you know, we're voyeurs in a lot of ways. We like to sort of uh, look at Black Death, and we're interested in this spectacle because it sort of makes, it sort of elevates our archive to have the thing that that people want want to come see. And you know, I think um, this project, uh, you know, I think one of the really important things that that we've done with this project is we're pushing against uh, that narrative and that way of working. Um, to say that, you know what, we can tell that story in a different way, right? We don't have to sort of focus on the violence of, of black people being killed um, and sort of the images of, of sort of that death being out there. We can tell the story in different ways and we can respect people um, who are being sort of, uh, who are communicating, right, in, in, on these platforms and telling their stories and, and sharing these new narratives. So I think the archives community has a long way to go um, to get there, right? This sort of ethics of care is not something that the archives community um, embraces at all, um, and you know, I, I think we're we're pushing against that. Um, and I, you know, I have to admit, even when I started looking at um, social media archiving, you know, I was, you know, one of those people. I was like, well, there's so much stuff out there. Let's get it all. Let's get it all. And you know, I remember uh, conversations on Twitter with with three people, particularly uh, Stacy Williams. Uh, Jared Drake and um, uh, Meredith Clark, who were pushing against that, right? Who were saying, well, did you get permission? Or did you let people know that you're getting this information? And a lot of archivists, you know, we think about sort of getting the data and building tools, and we don't think about interacting with people, right? Because, you know, when I bring this up, you know, I, I remember bringing, bring this up in, uh, in our Slack channel, and someone was like, well, it's, it's impossible to, to really think about ethics because there's so much data. And it's like, well, that's, that's not the problem we should be focusing on. You know, we should be focusing on respecting people first, and let's see what solutions can come out of that. So um, I think the archives community has a long way to go in sort of thinking about uh, people as we work with this kind of data. I mean, there's something interesting to me in, in thinking about this as somebody who does slavery, who's thinking about does slavery, who's thinking about slavery all the time. Um, I'm reading a wonderful book, devastating and wonderful in its impact and, and what it does for thinking about history uh, by Marisa Fuentes called um, This Possessed Bodies. Um, and, and I can tweet it out. I and mean, one of the things that she's theorizing for us is um, are the ways that enslaved women and, free, and freed women of African descent appear in the archive, appear to us in our historical renderings um, with the 
the phrase is mutilated historicity. So the ways that there is no way to actually remove the violence that they were subject to from how they appear to us later on. And that violence gets retransmitted in the kind of narratives that we create. And this is gonna be also be familiar from Cydia Hartman, the scenes of subjection, um, folks who are talking about anti-blackness. Um, and I think that there are ways that that, that, that it can be something we think about. You know, what are the ways that that project of just getting all of the data is also an inherently violent project, um, and inherently violent to particular communities in different kinds of ways, um, is sort of inherently a silencing project, uh, where you only get certain voices, where you then don't get that archived request to take something down, to take an image of violence or, and, and pain and, and a moment of grief down. Um, you know, how do we have that as part of this conversation? Because there may not be a way to take that mutilated historicity out of just a project of, of blackness or archiving blackness, but there may be, is there a way to kind of, again, the, re, the word redress keeps coming back to me, to rebalance that and to make that part of how we have a conversation. Um, and I don't know, you know, like I think that, but I, I do think that there's something to, you know, we have the archive that gets created when we don't take these requests or don't take these moments into account. And that is the archive of the slave, slave trade, the slavery and the slave trade. And it is a violent and a very, it's a devastating archive. And I don't think that's something we want to recreate. Um, it's not something we can also avoid though. So, you know, like finding ways to kind of navigate ourselves through that and create something that is, um, that is in engagement with that, um, that reality, but also you know, contest it, you know, is a counter to it. Can there be a counter to that, um, to that violence? I think a lot of archives are kind of thinking of it in a naive way where they're like, well, Twitter is democratized place where everyone can have an account to edit. It's not that we're grabbing it all, we're sure we're getting all of the voices and not understanding that there's still no like participatory narrative building when we do that. So they think it's better than what they've done before, only getting the papers of white men. But there's still kind of And I th you know, so one question I have is, um, so, you know, we, we're in the archives library world, so, I mean, we deal every day in sort of, you know, building collections that we hope folks like you will use, right, in doing your research. Um, but we're here talking about um, social media archives, web archives, and, and this is the most diverse, you know, room I've been in talking about these things, right? Um, you know, I'd, I what? challenge anyone here to, you know, <laughs> who's to say that they've been in a more diverse room talking about these subjects. Um, you know, the reality is the social media uh, uh, web archiving space is really white, right? And so, you know, I wonder what that means for, um, 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 you know, as, as far as content for you to do your work. You know, what does that mean, right? Um, um, are, are, are the people sort of building these collections thinking about uh, uh, these issues that, that you're talking about, and what does that mean for you know these social media archives, these web archives that you're going to dig into over the next 10, 20 years to do your work? Um, what will be missing there, and how can uh, uh, scholars like yourself come into that community, right, um, with other projects like Doc Now and and other projects to sort of give your voice and to help us think about a more full record? I mean, I think that one thing is that I hate the word diversity because it's come to like mean. Nothing, like, Nothing. you know. Yeah. But for lack of a better word, I think it speaks a lot to why diversity is needed, not only in, at the archivist level, at the research level, at the activist level. Um, we have like kind of a story we always tell people about um, a study that was presented where um, a person had interpreted a tweet to be about Sesame Street, and the tweet was actually about Waka Faka Flame, the rapper, but the person thought that the hashtag free Waka Flocka was a reference to like not canceling Sesame Street and had presented this like whole research thing about like how people were using and some of the people in the room are laughing because they know who Waka Flocka Flame is and what and other people in the room are like, I don't know what you're talking about, which is the problem, right? <laughs> so that was the problem was that like most of the audience was like, oh, okay, cool, this is like a tweet about Sesame Street and like a couple of us in the room were like <laughs> No, it's not. Like, you actually are completely interpreting that data wrong. And I mean, I, th I think that speaks to, like, why it's important to have diversity in all spaces because, like, not just even in, the in, like, thinking about how to collect data, but thinking about how to interpret data, thinking about how to archive data, like, people will see different things. 
Um, and some of those things without certain contexts will not be accurate. Um, so that's kind of a funny like, story. <laughs> I tell that story all the time. It's also, um, I'm thinking of that story, and it, it's also, I don't know, like in, in your question in the story, there's also play here for you know, the important role that you know, black studies plays, that ethnic studies plays, that women and gender sexualities play in you know, working with um, the data, the people, the people in the data, the communities, the, like, the cultural context that this work is getting created. Because it is its intellectual work. Like, if you've ever tried to, and my NYPD is a good example, if you ever try to create a good hashtag, it's actually not that easy to find something that's nice, you know, truncated, that gets at the idea, all of that. So, um, so in thinking about like the intellectual production that's happening, you know, how to be engaged with it is an ethical project that black studies has been and should be and actually should probably be more invested in and needs to be, you know, you know, is, is a space, you know, there, there are practitioners who, who can use this work and, and translate it. Um, I think there's also something in your question that's about sort of larger makeup of the academy and how that works <laughs> in our classrooms, like K through 12 classrooms also, um, charter schools, public schools, private schools, all of those, and, and how people are using, um, using the goods. And, um, and I think that that is, is a really important conversation that, you know, that probably needs more space than, than a short, short answer here. But I think, I think that there's something, some subtext there <laughs> in thinking about how do we push the the work that we're doing broadly in, in education and in producing knowledge to be accountable to all kinds of cultural contexts, including the ones in which this, this work is being created. Mm -hmm. Mark, you want to jump in? Yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm thinking just generally that we're dealing with these issues of how black studies in this particular instance holds everybody accountable, right? When we talk about the labor of black studies, you know, beyond our own, it's actually having to be up in these digital streets trying to make sure the folks get the stories right. Um, mm -hmm. I think about there was a, one of these uh, online sites did a piece about the Dallas shooter and trying to connect him to the legacy of Marcus Garvey. Is if somehow well, you could, first of all, do that in 750 words, <laughs> and if the person who was actually writing it had any capability to understand any part of the legacy of Marcus Garvey, let alone connected it to the Dallas shooter. Um, and we know that stuff happens all the time, right? It's almost to the point now that you almost want to tell every journalist, like, you can't write about black stuff if you've never taken a black studies class. And guess <laughs> what? Very few of them are taking black studies classes, right? So this becomes the work that we now do to order some sort of con contextualization for what's being written about, whether it's in the archive or more generally in the public in a, in a more traditional sense, and, and also having to hold people accountable within that context. Right. Again, to talk about the visibility of black studies now, because of the exhaustive labor that it has to do to not only produce the work, but police the uses of the work in this context also. I think we're out of time. Anyone else want to jump in on this? We have about three minutes. I'd love to hear mm -hmm. from anybody who's working in archives that are um, dealing with sensitive topics. Uh, I'm thinking I did a presentation at LASA recently and it was working with both historians and archivists who are working in, you know, f like archives that have disappeared. You know, folks who are, you know, present, like I work in slavery and, you know, there are descended communities, but I'm not dealing with like the grandchildren necessarily, although they're not that far removed, it's not that long ago. The grandchildren of the enslaved. Um, but we're talking about people who like, you know, really can go to jail if this document or that protest or their image appears. Sorry, is anybody here working in archives like that or has had engagement in archives like that? Yes. <laughs> Um, so we, uh, Colin and I, uh, Meredith Clark is also on the advisory board, so we look forward to her not being here today. Um, and I called the Matthew at NYU, obviously, to try to report on Black Lives Matter and Curtis, which is going to be great and awesome if you all read it. Um, and so one of the uh, issues that we encountered was how do we uh, present and um, discuss some of these tweets that we analyzed. Uh, we analyzed 40.8 million tweets, so about 30%. Uh, and police shootings between 2014 and 2015, and uh, we were very sensitive to the exact question that you raised, Jessica, which is um, how do 
how do we uh, remain sensitive to uh, some of the legal and, and uh, personal and just sort of privacy issues and intellectual property issues that you that are presented by just taking people's information and putting it out there in ways that they didn't necessarily intend, right? Um, because people, I think, have certain expectations when they put things out on Twitter um, and so to reappropriate them in ways that could potentially be harmful, in ways we can't predict. Mm -hmm. um, So what we ended up doing is we uh, we didn't we quoted tweets by linking to them. We didn't put the tweets in the report itself. We said, okay, well, if you want to, if you want to click on this and follow it, you can do that. Um, we found that that was a really nice uh, way of compromising because people wanted to present the information so people wanted to see the examples, but while also allowing the people that were being linked to to sever that connection if mm. they wanted to by deleting it. That's a great idea. Um, so that left some of the agency in their hands rather than if we had actually put the tweets in there. It was in the report, they can't mm -hmm. access that, take that out of the one. But by LinkedIn, we said, okay, well, we sort of almost kind of like handicapped ourselves a little bit. That goes back to our commitment, uh, I think Sarah was talking about, uh, of, of respecting the autonomy of the individuals who post this stuff and not decontextualizing it to the point where they would lose uh, the, the autonomy, the ability to control access to that content uh, consistently the way they want to get access to it. Yeah. I mean, Well, and I saw your question, you tweeted me while I was talking, your question about when I said we didn't include tweets that had been deleted, even though we had them in our data, and you said why not include them anonymously? Mm -hmm. And the answer is because we had millions of tweets to choose from, so why choose the ones that had been deleted? The ones that were deleted weren't any qualitatively different than the ones that hadn't been deleted, so we could still include the ones that people had chosen to leave up and it still tells the story, it still keeps the record, and it respects the fact that some people felt Right, it wasn't as if by not including those tweets we left out a part of the story. There's still millions and millions and millions of tweets that tell that story. And so I think that's like where you have to make those sort of call, like crucial calls is that, you know, yes, of course it's important to tell the story of people who might otherwise be erased, but there's so much, that's the nice thing about this platform is now there's so much data that you can respect the folks. Like I know some, some black women activists on Twitter who have specifically tweeted and said, Act, uh, scholars, do not cite me, do not quote me, I don't want my cultural labor being used to like help you get tenure or whatever, right? And I'm like, fine, like, I mean, there's lots of other people tweeting similar things, so it's not as if by not including those folks who've requested to be left out that we're not telling like the story of 21st century black feminist activism, you know what I mean? We're just respecting the fact that those particular people don't want their voices in the record, and. That's, I mean, I think that's okay. Yeah. No, I think that's okay, and I think that's what archivists, that's what we do. What we, what we call that is a label in our field. And what I find, what mm. I find exciting about the digital realm is that individuals now have to curate their own stuff, right? You have to let people know, don't cite me. You have to let people know how you want your information to be used, and that's an invitation to the 
public that's growing, particularly if it negatively affects you, yeah. that's what we've done for centuries. The challenge again is, it's online. Mm -hmm. So how do we, do we cut it off and then do that? And we sift through that and say, okay, these are people that aren't, or this is of historical significance or not, or that's what we do, but how do we, we can't do it and not collect it first. Mm -hmm. There's also an emphasis there on the speed that I think we haven't appropriately emphasized. That this is all happening right now. And yeah. it's not like it's happening and it's just faster. It's all happening sort of at once. You know, those three, many, like I just named three, but those many conversations that people are having with themselves, putting something out there. What does it mean that I put it out there? What does it mean that somebody else saw it? What are other people thinking? All those are happening at the same time in like milliseconds at this point. And so this work of sort of detangling, you know, the, the power of the archive, the violence of the archive, like what gets created, what gets left out, all of that. Like we're dealing with this because it's sped up so quickly and now we're forced to confront it in ways that we, I don't think we've ever had to do that before. Yeah, and um, we write about the risks with that too, right? I mean, we, what's wrong the methodology is not understanding or knowing the context in which those things are created, right? So you are inferring saying, okay, I know that this incident happened at 10.01 and now all of a sudden I see Twitter feeds and you're doing it based on a time stamp or based on a location stamp or assuming that you know who's really behind that handle. There's risk then, there's risk in that. But we know as scholars that that's context we'll put in our narrative. Right. A journalist or you know a high school student or an elementary school student or a lay person who now is at the barbershop saying, you know, look, everybody's gonna die tomorrow because this tweet was on there. There's, you know, how do we, how do we explain that to the masses so that everybody can start to be more educated about the use of I know Burgess is about to say we have to finish, but really quickly, I just want to shout out my colleague Moya Bailey actually has a great speaking to that. Um, it's a guide for teaching social media and it's like teaching eth the ethics of social media to students in the classroom. Um, and I can tweet, a, I'll tweet a link to it yeah, to, the, to the community yeah. because that's. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. I think Meredith and I are going to continue to have some disagreements. Um, <laughs> But this was a really, really great discussion. And thank you to our panelists. Uh, really great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.